<clears throat> oh, we're official now. <laughs> That's right. I forgot my black tie. <laughs> well, darn it. So, um, Rebecca? Yes, yes. You made one painting of a poppy, right? Uh huh. Oh, okay. poppies. Yes, I painted some poppies. Mm hmm. Flowers are fun. Oh, they, I had a wonderful time. Yeah, it was really a lot of fun. I really enjoyed learning um, blending techniques and, well, you know. <laughs> It was um, a, a lot of fun. So I just, you know how it just kind of, it gets into your heart. Yes, it does. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's already in my heart. It's like, it's, I just am so excited about it. <laughs> oh, we're picking up Brad and Michelle and uh, elder and sister Eastman. Elder and Sister Eastman, can you hear me? You're in the conference. Yep. We can hear you. Good. Okay. Where do you guys live? Logan. In Logan. Okay. Well, oh, there's a lot of good artists up there in Logan. You bet. <laughs> and let's see, Kent Farnsworth, can you hear us? I can. Kent, where are you from? I'm from Salt Lake. Welcome. Thank you. Let's see. Brad and Michelle. Oh, is that Brad Crop? Wow. Hey Brad, how you doing? How you doing, Tom? Hi, Vaughn. Hey, Brad, we, uh, me and Roxanne were having a great time talking your paintings up here just a little while ago. I've got them on my uh, screensaver just to remind me about some of the things we talked about when we did that Zoom. Oh, yeah, yeah, like a couple months ago, yeah. Well, that Zoom was kind of what gave us the idea for doing this. Oh, is that well, right? Well, this this seems like it could be really interesting. Why not? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. And can you help me a minute? Dewey. So Dewey? Okay. Well, let's see. If, if we got one more minute. We're going to start right on time. Mary Ziegel. Okay. Mary, can you hear us? Okay, it's time. Um, There'll be more joining us, I'm pretty sure. But uh, Roxanne, did I just do something wrong here? I clicked on the wrong thing here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm just okay. hiding for the moment. Well, welcome everyone. Um, this is our very first uh, Art Speak. And uh, the idea actually arose from something I did with Brad, Brad a little while ago. Uh, it's a, an opportunity for artists who have accomplished um, art, significant art work, and uh, it's a chance just to talk to them and ask them questions about their artwork, to see it on the screen, and to um, listen to Tom explain how he did it and why he did it and what colors and what the design was and what the reference was that he used. I think all that's just so fascinating. And I just don't want to miss out on it because there's so many good artists in the state that we never connect with because we're so spread out. So Zoom is a way to get us together. So uh, Roxanne, would you please explain 
how people can make comments or chat if they want. There, if, there's not really there that many of us, so I don't think that's going to be a problem unless we get quite a few more people. Yes. Um, if you go down to the bottom of your screen or somewhere in your screen, you'll see reactions. And you can raise your hand by pressing that. Um, of course, my computer's not doing what I want it to do right now. But at um, any rate, you can. Hey, am I for sure blocked? And um, what I will do is my mouse will do it. Um, I, I will keep everybody muted until um, you raise your hand and then we'll unmute you and then you can make a comment or you can use the chat and uh, do a chat either way. Can you hear me? I need to go put that in the freezer, but I'm missing the meeting already. Let me make sure I'm blocked. I need to make sure. I didn't want to risk it. Unfortunately, my mouse will run out of juice. Look at the Vaughn, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Our uh <clears throat> Our guest artist today is um, is Tom Howard. Tom is a well-known artist in Utah. He's uh, got quite a history, and I think I'd rather let uh, Tom uh, tell you about how he became an artist and what he's been doing. Tom, go ahead. You ready for me to start? Yes. Okay. You asked for it. I mean, let's get started. <laughs> okay well uh oh how did i get my start <clears throat> where to begin you know i had all kinds of early formative experiences as a boy that i didn't realize were formative experiences at the time but looking back they they were and i kind of figured that out after the fact but I think where things really began in earnest for me was when uh, I was engaged to be married and that night in um, at the library at, uh, at Utah State, my fiance was trying to do her homework and I was being a disruptive influence. And uh, uh, finally she closed her books up and looked at me and she said, so why don't you want to go to college? Because I had no plans to go to college at that time. The long story short is I was a little afraid of the prospect of going to college. And I um, was a bit nervous about that. I didn't think I was really up for it. But finally, she talked me into, into it. And I said, you know, if I went to college, I'd study only one thing and that would be visual art. She didn't say anything except, I'll support you, I'll help you. And it's uh, it's been great ever since. And so that's what that's how I really got going in earnest. That was, uh, well, that was in the spring of 79. We were married in June of 79. I began my studies at what was, what is now Salt Lake Community College. Uh, in the fall of 79, went from there to uh, the U to get my bachelor's degree and went from the U. Well, I worked for 10 years in private sector. And then I uh, went to BYU to get my master's degree and have been teaching and working in various jobs to support my habit as an artist ever since. And through all that, my wife and I raised five children, and they're grown up and moved away, and most of them married. And now we have uh, we have uh, uh, five grandchildren. So feel very fortunate that way. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of. I mean, we, we, yeah, go ahead. 
question? Heard a voice. Uh, no, I think, uh, Tom, that was a startup noise. Okay. All right. Um, 19 people on right now. Okay. So, um, anyway, I'm going to hit share screen. Okay. And I'm going to get started with my part of the presentation. So, someone was mentioning poppies. And I remembered this poppy painting I did. Of a, from a friend's photo that they posted on Facebook years ago. And so I thought I'd share that with you real quick. One of the things I wanted to start out with immediately was what this graphic shows and illustrates. Uh, one sometimes gets into learning how to work in a medium, such as watercolor or oil painting or pastel or whatever the medium may be. and they need to have a good foundation in, in uh, important basics of visual art in order for them to be able to work well in the medium, medium of their choice. So I have right in the middle here, you can see this art pyramid, which lists drawing is right at the very foundation. Do you want to watch that and I can listen to this? Oh. So, um, I'll figure out something. Someone needs to silence their. Uh, yeah, someone needs to silence their uh, sound. Okay, and then uh, from drawing and skill, we go to composition and design, and then color theory. And then, at the very pinnacle of all that, once you have these skills and principles down in each of these areas of concern. Then, when you jump into painting or working in the medium of your choice, all you're really doing is solving uh, the technical aspects of working in your medium, and it becomes a lot uh, uh, simpler for you if you can establish good drawing skills and so on. So here in this uh, little uh, quarter panel I have, basically the, the skills of drawing that I teach. There are more advanced skills than that, but these are what I share with my foundational students. And then off to the right, we have the <clears throat> composition and design. We have the principles, and then we have the elements. And I teach them as two separate groups. And then we have color theory, learning how to work with color. And then from there, it's a matter of applying it to the medium of your choice. So I just wanted to share that with you to give us all a perspective on what I, what I try to do as a teacher, but also what has helped me as an artist. Okay, so let's move on from there to the paintings. First one we have up here is a watercolor. It's called Evening Gold Near Grace. Now this is one of those experiences that I had well after I had been there decades ago. Uh, when I was a young man, I drove combine for a farmer and we cut wheat and barley throughout Northern Utah and Southern Idaho. And this is uh, in the mountains above Grace in Southeast Idaho. And I actually photographed this scene in the dead middle of the day, heat of the day. And yet I knew precisely what I was going to do with it as soon as I photographed it. Why? Because of past experiences that I have had with this uh, with with this scene or scenes like this. Harking back to those times when I would be cutting wheat and barley late into the evening, even into the nighttime hours. And um, so what this is, is a painting, just basically painting the golden hour uh, just before sunset. And it's a time when the whole scene is just bathed in the golden light of the evening. What I did is I first worked in acrylic and then I applied watercolor over the top. 
of that. My purpose in doing that was to lay down a layer of color that once it dried, I knew that it would not reconstitute as I was subsequently going to lay other colors down over the top of it. And so that yellow color and those bits of uh, golden orange, it was a pale yellow, uh, warm yellow, orange, those are the foundational colors. And everywhere you see that throughout the picture plane of the scene, those are all foundational acrylic layers I first laid down. And then everything else on top of that is transparent watercolor. And as I painted the scene, uh, from the original photo, you would not see the kind of perspective that you're seeing in this scene here. But as I point out with my cursor, we have lines like this, this line here, even this line. We have this line, this one. These are all perspective elements. They lead, they lead the eye back into the depth of space. They create that illusion of the depth of space. And so that's how the, that's one way in which the visual artist can paint three-dimensionally on a two-dimensional surface. All we do is just play in a very careful manner with angles to create that illusion. And from there, it was a matter of just putting in the lights and the darks. And this is really, in the end, what it is. It is a secondary... Uh, triad relationship of colors. The dominant color is yellow, and then we have greens, and then we have violet. And uh, those are the main color, um, main elements of color that you see, and that's a secondary triad color relationship. Any questions about this scene before I move on? about this painting? Uh, I have a question. Can you hear me? You sure, fire away. Uh, this is Vaughn, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. You, uh, I heard you talk a long time ago about uh, Stephen Quiller's uh, color theories. Right. And uh, is was, did, did that influence your choices in this painting? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, um, <clears throat> for the most part, I have, I don't have any browns in my, in my palette. I have what uh, Stephen Quiller called a spectral palette. And it's basically reds, yellows, blues, greens, oranges, and violets. And, um, uh, then I've got a few pet colors on the side that I keep around for various applications. But um, it's basically a, a primary secondary spectral palette that I work with. Uh, the right combinations of colors, I can get any browns that I want. Brown is just a version of gray. And so, you know, some people like using the browns. They know what those browns can do, and that's great. Me, I like to mix with the uh, with the spectral colors. I think it helps with, I think, the vibrancy and the vitality of the scene. But that having been said, I've seen some really nice monochromatic watercolors done with just burnt umber, and they look really good. But Stephen Quiller is also the one that I learned the idea of laying down a wash of acrylic and then watercolor on top, and it will hold. He's the one who taught that. What year was that? 2013, I think, when we brought him to Utah. And, um, <clears throat> or maybe it was 12. But anyway, um, yeah, when we brought him to Utah, we, he taught that idea. The thing to remember about laying down acrylic first and watercolor second is to make sure that acrylic goes on. There's a very thin wash. It needs to soak in, it needs to be a thin wash. That way, um, there's enough 
surface left on the paper for the watercolor to hold. Otherwise, you have trouble with uh, making the watercolor stay on the surface. Other questions from anybody? This is Roxanne. Tom, did you cover the whole surface with a light layer of the uh, of the acrylic? I did. Okay. I did. Now, I once heard uh, John Salmon and say that if you totally cover a white sheet of paper in making a watercolor and you have no white left, it can have a deadening effect on the watercolor. I think I kind of understand what he means by that. But then again, that's 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 a that's a rule of thumb. That's not something that's so hard and fast that that rule can never be broken. So as you look here, there's not a stitch of the white of the paper left. It's all painted in that golden hour yellow. Yeah, but it glows. And that's the idea was to create that glowing effect. And in the end, acrylic is actually naturally a far more luminescent medium than even watercolor. Um, are there any questions out there that uh, people want to ask? Uh, uh, Roxanne, how do we... Um, some of these folks joined us recently, so I'm not sure they know how to... Okay. Um, if you if you raise your hand with reactions or uh, send a chat, either way we'll we'll um, get your question to Tom. So if you look at your screen, there's reactions. So you if you click right on the word reactions, you see a list of items that you can choose from, or just click raise hand, and that means that we know you want to comment, or if you wish you can type a chat in to um, everyone and uh, we'll uh, we'll see that. And we'll get that question to Tom. Okay, I'm ready to move on then if we have no other questions. Yeah, and if somebody raising back to this, we can do that. Uh, this is Dewey. I did not go to the Stephen Quiller workshop. I've heard you talk about this before. On my own, I tried this. Um, foundation of ac acrylic and it was a disaster i don't think you have time to talk to me about it tonight but sometime if we could just help me figure out what i did wrong because it just did not work for me well let me ask you this question first did you let the layer of acrylic that you laid down totally dry before you came over the top with watercolor yes i did okay not it too dark I, 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 it was just ugly and, and I need, I want to try it again, but I'm just. Yeah. One has to think carefully about how and when to use this. It's certainly not my go-to move every time I make a painting. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of my paintings are not done this way, but once in a while, it's a great tool to have in your quiver to use. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Mm-hmm. So I have this painting um, of, uh, this is actually known as Tori Knoll. And I just learned of that recently. It's called Tori Knoll. Uh, it's just a, I think it's just a beautiful cliff. And I love, I've loved painting it over the years. This is one of those where I've done, you know, a dozen or more versions of this scene and can't ever seem to get quite enough of it. But this is uh, near Torrey, Capitol Reef National Park. Um, you've got the red sandstones and then you've got that bluish gray uh, segment, which is uh, bentonite soil, which is a really interesting soil to learn about. But uh, this is just a straight up, straightforward watercolor no acrylic and basically what I did with this particular piece is I did what I typically call um, it's just my typical approach it's light to dark top to bottom back to front and general to specific 
And so light to dark meant uh, I started with the lighter colors first and then went to the darker tones. Uh, top to bottom, I started from the top, worked my way down. It's a way of logistically keeping my hand out of my work. Back to front, typically in a landscape painting, the uh, most distant elements I'm gonna paint first, and then I paint coming forward into the picture plane helping to create an, an wow. atmospheric sense of the depth of space. Super. And that's how this uh, painting came together. Any questions about this? Tom, I, when I looked at this, I think I saw a different version of this because there were some really intense yellows and oranges down close to this strip of uh, kind of ice blue. Uh, toward oh, yeah. The and, right in here. Yeah, man, I thought that, that yeah, I couldn't take my eyes off it because that, that brilliant, it, it, you've got some in this one right up in the upper right hand side. But uh, in the one I saw, there was that color. I don't know what color you use, but it was like the paper was on fire. And, mm. and then right next to that ice blue, it was uh, really amazing to look at. It was, uh, in fact, this one is amazing too, but but uh, I just think the way you intersperse those layers, it's like, it's like they're woven. And, uh, and you've got these brilliant, orange and blues and yellows interspersed with blue. And, uh, you know, it, it just about pops your eyes out of your head. Well, it's basically a uh, complementary color relationship. Orange and, orange and blue are complements of each other. Red and green are complements of each other. There's no true red in here. They're all pretty much orange, but they get pretty close. And then the the greens and the yellows are analogous color relationships. And uh, that's, um, so I, I play that game between uh, analogous and, and complementary color relationships, even within the same painting. And in the end, what I'm doing is I'm also, as I'm working with this, I'm thinking of value light against dark, dark against light, that's how we see. The values in this one also hold my eyes. Uh, there's that little crevice right in the center. And it's got really dark cracks in the lock there. It, okay, it, somebody's it, over talking it, here. Right. We're hearing someone talking during the conversation. Sorry. Let me just take uh, the color right out of it. That's what you have. If you want to understand this in terms of values, take the color out, and that's what you have. How many times have you painted this one, Tom? Uh -huh. Oh, at least a dozen or more. Yeah, at least a dozen or more. I no, think my uh, daughter has number 15. She owns number 15 in the series. Well, what's the, what's the actual size of this? Uh, this, is, um, this is a 15 by 15, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's about that size. No, no, I, I've got a couple that are 20 by 22. I've done them that big. This particular painting is an eight and a half high by 22 inches wide. Ready to move on to the next one? 
Anybody got any questions? Um, this is Roxanne again, and I do have a question. Um, do you, it's, it's clear to me that you let it dry before you hit it, hit it to make the cliff indentations. But so when, when you made those really beautiful white topped bushes in the foreground, is, is that like wet into wet or wet into dry? Talking about right in here? Yeah, right in there. Okay, these are pretty much wet into wet. Well, there was a drying process of going along, so it was um, it was yellow, and then coming in with these lighter toned greens. The mm -hmm. color, so as watercolor, when you first apply it, it depends on how thick of a layer of paint you lay down as to how the medium is going to, to behave. The more pigment you have in your, in your mixture, as you put another color next to it, they're going to kind of blend, but kind of stay in their place better. Kind of like a coffee or milk level kind of consistency. But if you're painting it at tea-like, consistency, the the colors are really going to mingle a whole lot more. So this is actually pretty thick pigment. And as I came with the thick pigment of green next to it, they softened some, but they held as well. And then the lights were, were brought in, or excuse me, the darks were brought in after that. That's just a stunning painting, Tom. It Thank actually you. is. Thank you. Okay, ready to move to the next. <clears throat> now, here's the painting that I have done a bajillion versions of. As a matter of fact, it's a, it's a drawing assignment in my foundation class, and it's also a... Uh, an assignment in my design class. This is a tree that I, a juniper that I found in Capitol Reef National Park. And it's one of those that just kind of said, here I am, paint me. And I, I just, I had to. I took one single photo of it and I've done, literally, I'm in the 20s as far as numbers of times I've painted this, this scene here or drawn it. And so um, what's interesting to me about this is how there's evidence of erosion that has taken place over the lifetime of this tree, uh, where my cursor is tracking right across here. That was probably the original ground level. And then everything underneath is actually the exposed root system. And um, and then, uh, so the process was the sky first, this distant mountain second, coming into the middle ground, coming into the foreground, and actually getting a lot of this close to being done before I came back up and painted the tree. There is a saying in visual art circles, in painting circles, it says, see what you paint or, or paint what you see first last and paint what you see last first and the idea really is to really lay the groundwork for the central piece of your painting the focal point lay the background down for it get all of that ready so that when you lay in what is the focal point or the star of the show, uh, you yourself as an artist, as you're watching it, are also um, excited about what you see and what's what's coming together. Hey, Tom, <clears throat> yes. there's a couple of things in this painting that really stand out at me. And one is on the left side of that cedar, it looks like you've done wet and wet so it's soft looking. In here? 
uh, on the left side. Left this, side. On the left side of the tree, it's uh, where the green green color is. Through here? Just a second. There's a little bit of wet into wet. There's a bit of uh, dry brush. There's a bit of everything in there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just, I just, one thing that stood out to me was you've got this soft looking green mass on the left and this prickly, stickery, uh, neutral color on the right. Of the branches? Yeah. 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 Which is a, it's a real contrast. Well, that's part of the uh, beauty of this tree is how it, uh, it has that kind of quality about it. Um, and it was just natural. This is the way the, the tree was. And all I'm doing is just sharing what I found with the world through the painting. Um, so Hunt, uh, uh, Gunther Haydenthaler once in social media called it the rock star. And so that little nickname is stuck with it. It's kind of like Robert Plant up on the stage, arms stretched out, his hair back, looking all dramatic. So it's it's the kind of thing that sticks with me with that. So that is that particular tree. Hey, Tom, I've got another question. Yes. I've uh, learned from some artists who say, they never do the same image twice. In other words, they right. It either works for them or not, but they <clears> go <throat> on to something else if it doesn't work. And and uh, but I hear you saying you do some of these images many times. Yes. And what's your motivation for doing that? Are you trying to get something exactly right, or are you just uh satisfying demand other people want the painting so you do another one it's mostly just to satisfy my own curiosity I, I i look at it and i say i think there's another one in here i'd like to try this or that idea for example some of these colorful reflections of light within the shadowed side of the tree that was something that i was kind of gunning for, as well as this beautiful reflection of red in the underside of this rock that someone put on top of the root of the tree here. Um, little things like that, you know, you've done one, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to try another. You think some more, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try that. You know, if there's still um, something to be learned for me from having from doing the painting i will do it so yeah well i i want to do that too uh except that i i have this little voice ringing in my head saying well no no that's enough go on to something else but i really i really want to uh it's, it's, i make mistakes or something i use the wrong color or something and i want to get it right so i i do it again I make mistakes in every painting I make, even the same image. You know, I'm, I'm making mistakes in every painting. It's part of our fact, fact of ourselves as human beings, we're not perfect. Yeah. Okay, any questions before I move on now? Okay. All right, so I wanted to share this painting of this tulip. It's entitled Two Tulips to Kiss. Um, sorry, I like wordplay. But uh, one of the things that was interesting about this for me is that this is where I broke my rule of light to dark, top to bottom, back to front, general to specific. I started with the yellow of the tulips first. And I established that yellow in there before I did anything else. And the reason why is because yellow is a color that contaminates real easily. 
So I wanted to get it in its place, let it dry, and then I could paint over the top of it and, uh, and protect that yellow in the best way possible. So sometimes when certain logistical um, concerns come up, that's what you need to do in order to uh, in order to complete the piece successfully. Looks like someone accidentally put a digital line through everything. Okay, one last painting to show on this uh, this screen here. And that's this one here of the butterflies. Now, Vaughn, you had a particular reason for me um, showing this one. What did you want to, what well, did you say or ask? It caught, it caught my eye. I was, I was going through all of your watercolor paintings online that I could find. And this uh, showed up quite a few years ago. Well, I don't remember, can't remember how long ago it was in uh, one of our art call uh, exhibitions. And it just stood out to me. One is that I've never seen a painting like this. And you've got this uh, obscure foreground in blue and these monarch butterflies in orange. And it, you know, it's in one, of the, one of those things that just, it just pops out. And then I wondered how you got, how you got your reference for this material, for this painting. Okay, good questions. Um, I watched a video on YouTube and it was inspired by what I saw. Uh, the makers of the video took a, uh, um, a uh, ceramic or a, or a model of a hummingbird and put rotary wings on it and then put this uh, put this uh, cage this uh, over the top so that the butterflies would not be hurt by the rotary rings wings of the uh, of the hummingbird drone that they made and they flew it up into the canopy of the trees and they got right in there with the butterflies as they were flying and this this drone was able to fly without doing any damage to the butterflies. This all happened down in New Mexico or, or, or Mexico, uh, where they overwinter, by the way. And uh, they the the video uh, showed all of these uh, attitudes of flight of the monarch butterflies as they were flying in the picture plane in the scene. And so, I froze the video. I did a screen capture. And then I put them together into this montage that shows several butterflies fly in their different attitudes of flight patterns. And uh, so the butterflies were actually painted first. And I got, I think, I think I got them pretty well complete before I even did the background. So again, that's kind of a breaking of my rule. But remember uh, the rules that I have, I think of them as rules of thumb, not hard, fast, or uh, absolute. And so the yellows and the oranges of the butterfly's wings went in wet into wet, according to what I was seeing from my reference. And then I painted in the darks of the butterfly wing patterns. And the last thing that went in was the opaque white uh, of those uh, white outer segments of the wings. And uh, the, the background patterns were just trying to reflect the kind of soft focus uh, imagery that I've seen throughout the video, trees and sky and, and um, that's that's how that came to be. Questions? Uh, did you did you do this more than once? This is the only time I have done this. Um, there are certain shapes of the butterfly flights that I like. For example, the wing. This one kind of looks like a B one bomber. I like this graceful shape here. I even like this shape here. 
And I thought maybe I might uh, redo those as a singular uh, feature of a butterfly flying. But I do like the uh, different attitudes of flight within the same image. I think it, uh, I think it tells a full picture of butterfly flight. Well, it seems to me that it also, you've got in the upper left quadrant, you it's it's kind of like a smooth light colored blue as right. if it's a, sort of it's like a where they're flying you know it gives the flight direction and I just think that enhances the idea of flying butterflies. My grandkids would love this. Well, yeah. So, uh, but another thing, even. The very last thing that went in, you need to understand that the very last thing that went in were all these spatters of inexplicable yellow that you see throughout the painting. I wanted to get that sense of randomness in there, uh, trying to get a sense, you know, convey a sense of the activity, the flight, the fluttering, the taking off, the, uh, the uh, almost helter-skelter of the moment. The white markings on the margins of the wings, uh, it, you mentioned opaque. It, it, how did you do that? I I do have opaque watercolor gouache. Yeah, gouache. That answers my it. question. Yep. Yeah. I just literally take the paint right out of the tube. I yep. rarely have it in my palette because when gouache dries, it tends to crumble. And it doesn't uh, reconstitute as well as a traditional cake of transparent watercolor. So um, I've been able to get past that problem with a couple of uh, uh, cakes of watercolors that I've made. But for the most part, when I use pure white, it's dipping the brush straight out of the tube. Right. Tube, yeah. I have a question. Yes. Um, how did you decide where to place the butterflies? Was there a thought process on composition in that? Yeah, there was a thought process on that. I, I kind of wanted to leave some space. I did end up connecting two of them physically. You can see right here where the cursor's tracking. I kind of felt like I needed two there. Uh, and then the others, there's space between them. And I just wanted to paint them in, in places where it felt like they might be flying naturally in relationship to each other and still be able to convey all of the attitudes of flight that I wanted to depict there. Does that answer that? Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. This is doing. Hey, Roxanne, uh, if somebody wants to unmute themselves, to ask Tom a question. Can they just hit the uh, space bar on their keypad? Will that um, work? I don't know. If they go on mine, if you go to the microphone and and click it, it will unmute and unmute you. Yeah, you can mute and unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, sorry, okay. Dewey, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm doing that. No, I just a comment. What I love about your painting is on the top butterfly above the ones that are touching, how you mm -hmm. the soft edge on the wing, the soft edge. So you've gone from soft edge to hard edge, and it just gives a feeling of distance and motion and movement. It's beautiful. You know, edges are so important. Transitions, edges from one thing to the next, from one area to the next. Edges do a lot to tell the story of the moment and what's happening. And um, it's important to understand that. And sometimes if you know what you're doing, even after you've painted the piece, you can obscure an edge after the fact, if you're very careful. And it's just a matter of controlling the water in the end. You're watching and controlling that water, and le not letting it do too much. And also at the same time realizing that uh, 
there's a bit of randomness to this act of watercolor painting. And sometimes it's going to do something that you just don't expect. And you have to decide whether you're willing to stay with that or move on or, or you know, or correct it or whatever you want to do. But you have to be able to roll with the punches with watercolor. Any other uh, questions? Uh, are there any other uh, paintings that you'd like to show us? There's some there's some questions I'd like to ask the group before people start uh, checking out. But Tom, um, is there something else you wanted to show us tonight? I did have a few other paintings. Okay. I did want to share this one. Let me pull this one out of that line that's on there. Um, so this is a scene from, again, Capitol Reef National Park. This is looking up from the top of Grand Wash. And uh, it's that towering dome is something I had just had a lot of fun painting. This is a fairly large piece. It's 11 by 22. It just, it was done, it was painted on plein air out there in, in the field. And I'm really pleased with the way that it came together. Sometimes when, when plein air painting, uh, un unless it's a competition, I rarely, if ever, try to paint super accurately in terms of co topographical reference. I'm really painting and, and working to paint the colors, the light, the values, the scene, the mood of the moment. That's what I'm trying to capture. When I take my plein air study and photographs back into the studio, I can play with them from there to come up with uh, a more finished uh, painting. So that's why I wanted to share with this one. This particular scene um, is very atypical for me but it came together so nicely as a as an ink drawing, I decided I would give it a try in watercolor and I was not disappointed. It's a part of my exhibit that just uh, closed down very recently at, at uh, Phillips Gallery. And this is kind of a, I don't know if this is a new direction for me or what, it just really came together nicely. And I think I'd like to try a few more of these. Yeah. This piece right here, this uh, um, iris was um, a challenge in preserving the white of the paper and uh, being able to get the darks as dark as they need to be in order for this iris to really stand out. I love the uh, the relationship of the, so we've got a kind of a analogous relationship between the yellows, greens, and the blues, but then we have a complementary relationship that occurs between blue and orange, and those kinds of color relationships are fun to play with. But again, as an exercise in understanding the value of color. Let me just take the color out of that. And, you know, it still reads very well, very strongly as a black and white. And um, I think that's important to have that experience in, um, in watercolor painting to understand what value a certain color really is. You can paint an intense red, but when you desaturate it, it's nothing more than a five, six, or seven on the grade scale. It's a bland, dull gray. So something to remember about things like that. And then I wanted to share this one lastly. So this is part of my occasional series that I'm doing 
uh, talking about the war, uh, de depicting the war between Russia and Ukraine. Of course, now we could probably add <laughs> what we're seeing in between Israel and uh, Hamas now to that list. But this is kind of, this is an occasional series. I'll do a few once in a while as a way of just uh, kind of bearing witness to what is happening in the world at, at points of conflict and and uh, great human suffering. And uh, just wanted to share that as a way of just showing a personal project and encouraging you to consider having a personal project. At some point in the future, I'll share this in some way. I don't know how, but for now, I just share it once in a while, give people little sneak peeks into uh, what I'm doing and let it go from there. Hey, Tom. Yes. I'm curious about the little sparkles uh, with the soldier's right hand and on his rifle. Did you, yes. how did you get those? Now I must go in and look. All right, so some of those are opaque white paint. Some are, um, yeah, some are just the white of the paper. I think this stroke is opaque white. This stroke is opaque white. I think these strokes are opaque white. Okay, so... There's a bit of that going on uh, to help really, to help the, um, the, the rifle to stand out against the background of the soldier's body. It's a part of the drawing of the piece. Thing to remember about this is that I'm still drawing and I'm still employing draw, drawing skill. I'm just using brush and paint, but it's still drawing. Any questions, any comments for anybody? This is this is the end of my presentation. I got nothing after this. Nothing, I tell you. <laughs> hey, Tom, uh, this was just really fun to talk to you and well, thank you. show us. There were uh, 33 people have uh, dialed in so far. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, so uh, more than I anticipated. Well, um, I wanted to hear. Uh, it, uh, Roxanne, is there a way for you to unmute everybody? Um, yeah. Or everybody can um, unmute themselves. Yeah. Or they, uh, they can. You... Yeah, I can't unmute them. I can invite them to unmute themselves, but they can just unmute themselves. So okay, what I wanted to first of all, I wanted to ask if anybody has uh, signed in from outside the Wasatch Front. Does Logan count? Yeah, we're in Logan. Yeah, yeah. In Logan, Logan counts. Anybody else? Okay, this is our first go at uh, having these uh, chats called art speak chat and query and uh, uh i'm really pleased with the way it's turned out i mean because a lot of you are interested and i think part of our ambition is to reach out to everywhere in the state and get people uh maybe artists from other part of the state and so forth but we need we need your critique. We need to know how we can make this better. So uh, what can we do to make this uh, better the next time we do it? I would like to just make the comment, just give you a very positive response. The convenience of being in your home and seeing the clarity of these paintings, um, hearing an artist talk about their history, how they developed, everything that's taken place tonight, I think has been outstanding. And it flows together easily. Uh, 
I would strongly encourage you to continue to do these on a regular basis. Um, I think that they're, uh, I've been painting for 30 years and, and it's amazing to compare techniques and to hear other people's approaches. And, and this is done in such an easy format. It's so accessible, I guess, is what I'm saying. Cool, thank, thank you so much. I, I, I don't know who that was that was speaking. Uh, my name is Kent Farnsworth. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. We, we really are excited about this. And uh, we, we really want it to be an opportunity to introduce artists to other artists. And uh, it's Tom and it's been great. Thank you. I learn so much every time I have the opportunity to listen to you present. Well, thank you very much. I'm very flattered to know that. Sometimes I'm, um, in your own little world, you're doing all, your own little thing. You can, you, <clears throat> you can think that you're alone, but getting together in, uh, in presentations like this, I think is a really good idea. What I like about this, this is Lucy Beal, um, oh, is that I can, hi, I can see the brush strokes. I can see the layering. Um, it, it's, it's just fascinating. I really appreciate it, Tom. And I appreciate how you explained why you did the pieces so that it has a context for me. I'm, um, I'm delighted with this presentation. Thank Great, you. thank you. Your comment about brush strokes, I think was very pertinent too. Tom, in one of your paintings, you, dr you, you drilled in on it very closely. So that we could actually, I don't know if that's done easily, but we can see uh, in a more graphic detail your strokes, and that's very informative. It's very easy to do. I just go here with my cursor up to the plus sign, and in we go. Oops. Oh, nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here we can see that while initially, initially there were some background colors, there were other stuff put into it while it was still wet. So, yeah. What else would you like to see in the future, folks? I've got a list of what was that? I, I I would like more of the same. I would love to hear from Smartus. I would also, um, this is Lucy again. I'd like to see you uh, to see someone who's expanding the use of water media to acrylic inks and That's pens funny. and crayons and um, and see how they're creating textures with those too. Yeah. Okay. Other ideas, folks? Any other suggestions on how we might conduct uh, other chats in the future? I'd love to hear more about how to get into galleries. This is Lisa, the Cash Valley chapter. Distintas ver más películas. As far as getting into galleries is concerned, um, Best piece of advice I ever received on that front was take care of the quality of your work first and make sure you've got quality work to present to a gallery. And then when you decide on a gallery you want to seek representation at, find out what their system is for reviewing you. A lot of them these days have something online that explains how they do it and what they want you as the artist to do. Okay. Do that and then um, take the time to follow up through email or phone call if you feel it's appropriate. Uh, the more you can develop kind of a, a personal relationship with the powers that be in the gallery, the better your odds of being able to get some representation 
That is provided that the quality of your work is there. Thank you. Anyone else? Amar tu trabajo. Tienes que amar tu trabajo. We're here in Spanish. Yeah. Oh, are we? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Tom, are you still teaching? Do you have classes? I teach uh, for Salt Lake Community College. I teach uh, design in the fall. And in the spring, I teach drawing and design. And then every summer semester, I have a watercolor class that I teach. I'm going to try and move my summer watercolor class from the Jordan campus down to the um, down to the new Harriman campus this coming su or summer 24. And I'll just see what kind of response I get there doing that, but uh, the idea is to move it around once in a while to the various campuses of Salt Lake Community College and to see what kinds of people or students have an interest in exploring this medium and give them a chance to take a semester in it. It's taught two evenings a week, Monday, Wednesday. Yeah. And well, then for example, this next week, um, every once in a while, I will teach a workshop for Utah Valley University. For example, this next week, we're going down to the Capitol Reef Field Station, and I'm teaching a three-day workshop there. So, yeah. Any other questions uh, or suggestions? Thank you all for uh, joining us today. This was, uh, I'm really happy right now uh, because I've been worrying for uh, several weeks that that uh, this new thing might not work, but it, it has. And uh, we got uh, lots of you signing in, so, uh, we're going to have another one of these. Uh, we'll talk amongst ourselves and decide when the next one will be. But I'm thinking maybe quarterly. Um, so if that holds up, uh, we'll do another one of these in January. And we'll get the word out the same way we did this one, uh, through, through emails. Emails and uh, communication from, uh, from the Utah Watercolor Society. Don't forget social media. <laughs> Those two. That's where you can start getting people from outside the Wasatch Front. Well, okay. Uh, I think we're done here. Uh, Roxanne, do you have anything to add? No, I think it, I think it's great. Thank you, Vaughn, for coming up with this and and uh, getting it going. It's fantastic. Thank you. And Thank you. Brad Crop deserves part of the credit because I got really interested in some of his work and never was able to quite link up with him face to face. So I called him on the phone and said, let's have a Zoom. He said, okay. So we did. And we really had fun talking about his art. And uh, I thought, gee, we could do that with anybody. I'll, I'll chip in on that. Yeah, we had a good conversation and, and, uh, I learned, both of us learned a lot from that one-on-one -on -one talk, I think, didn't we? Yeah. And uh, this is, this is, has been good. I hope you continue these. So yeah, we want put to. put that on the next show. I'm sorry, was there a question? This is Julie. My suggestion is put Brad as a presenter of the next show you do. <laughs> oh, Brad, you ready for that? You said you didn't want to do a, a workshop. Yeah, I've never, about... I've never had any. I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. The thing is, the caveat there is, I've never, you know, unlike Tom, I don't have any experience teaching or, or you know, I was a biologist before I, I retired. But yeah, I'd be willing to give it a shot. You know, like if this kind of conversational tone, um, like this is, I think much 
easier um, uh, than than actually giving a structured workshop to people. So get back to me about it. Well, the, the advantage is all the paintings are done. You're just talking <laughs> you, about them after the fact. Yeah, yeah. I think January would be a fantastic time. We're all uh, needing to lose weight, save money, and it, an evening listening to Brad would be fantastic. <laughs> well, great. Thank you all so much for coming and watching and listening. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Tom. Great job. Thank you.